grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. So what does love look like? It's an interesting question, especially if you ask a child, which we would have seen a little better if we had more children this morning to give us different definitions. But we know that love can be a noun or a verb. One dictionary source characterizes it this way. In the sentence, I knew in my heart it was love. The term love is an abstract noun according to this source, which means love isn't tangible or touchable. But if you look up tangible, you'll find that it can refer to something in the metaphorical sense. For example, tangible grief can be clearly sensed by an onlooker. Well, if grief can be tangible, I believe that love, the opposite of grief, can also be tangible. Consider, if you will, the sensations that accompany a visit to grandma's kitchen where she ant has anticipated your arrival for a holiday by cooking. You can literally smell the love that she has imbued into her dinner rolls. And the taste of her pecan pie, OMG. That's true love. For you as older folks, that's oh my God, OMG. What is it you hear when mommy or daddy coos to their six-month-old little girl and she giggles and blows bubbles back at them? Sounds like love to me. When your significant other rubs the knots out of your shoulders or massages your feet after a weary day of working in the yard, surely you can feel the love. And you can see the love of mommy and daddy as they coo to their little six-year-old girl, six-month-old girl. Examples of being able to see and sense love in action abound in this world. There is no doubt that God created the world for his children to see love, to know love, and to enjoy love with all of our senses. But what is or does love look like biblically? Our gospel reading this morning is about relationship and reciprocation. It is in the middle third of what are known as the farewell discourses that Jesus made to his disciples. These are considered some of the most important and difficult chapters in this gospel of John because, because they lay out the concluding remarks from Jesus to his disciples, his parting words, so to speak. Here Jesus explains how the disciples should maintain the bonds that, that, that have kept them together. The central theme, of course, is love. But more than that, it's about relationships. God's holy word teaches us early on that most important is that we love him. He commands it. In Mark 12, we hear of Jesus' response when the scribe asks him, which is the first of all commandments? The first is, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. We are to love God with all our hearts and minds, okay? But love our neighbor? So who is our neighbor and what has this to do with the love of God? Roberta Bondi, in her book, To Love as God Loves, I highly re recommend that, by the way, it's a good book. She looks at what God love and the love of God and the love of neighbors meant to those in the early church. The patriarchs of the early church acknowledged that it was important, even though often difficult, to love the people in our lives to whom we are related and those who are familiar to us. But they understood the gospel imperative to extend those feelings beyond our circle of family and friends. They professed that it was just as important to have the same level of love and compassion for those who are unfamiliar to us. In her book, Dr. Bondi cites a homily written by Dorotheus of Gaza, a sixth century monk to his brothers in the monastery. 
in which he appealed to them not to judge or condemn each other. But remember that love of God and of other people are so closely related that it is impossible to love God and have contempt for the sin and weakness of other people at the same time. He summed up his homily by saying, each one according to his means should take care to be at one with everyone else. For the more one is united with his neighbor, the more he is united with God. Dorotheus used a wonderful analogy to illustrate this relationship between loving God and loving his people. Imagine the world as a circle with God at the center. Now imagine straight lines from the circle to the center, kind of like the spokes of a wheel. Those represent our human lives. Each line is the same length. Now imagine that in our journey through life to move closer to God, we must move along the lines from the circle to God at the center. As we approach God, the lines draw closer together so that the closer we are to God, the closer we are to one another. The closer we get to each other, the closer we are to God. The opposite is also true. If we distance ourselves from God, the distance between us as humans increases. As you go from God in the middle to the outside, the lines separate. And if in our relationships we move apart from one another, we must also by necessity move away from God. This in effect leads away from successfully fulfilling the commandment to love the Lord our God. So loving our neighbor is part and parcel of loving our God. In John 10, the evangelist recounts Jesus speaking metaphorically to his followers. He tells them that the one who enters the sheepfold by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. He calls his own sheep by name. They know his voice and follow him as he leads them out. He next tells the disciples clearly, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. Here, Jesus establishes a precedent. There are other sheep, not of our sheep fold. The people we are most familiar with, those who share our beliefs, wear the same kind of clothes as us, eat the same kind of foods as us, are not the full extent of the flock that Jesus loves and protects. Ergo, the neighbors to whom we need to draw closer to and into relationship with are not just those closest to us on the wheel. That may make us uncomfortable, but overcoming that discomfort will make us more successful in obeying and fulfilling the commandment to love the Lord our God. And how do we overcome that discomfort? By emulating the relationship that Jesus has with the Father. Jesus tells us, tells us that he has kept his Father's commandments and abides in his love. All that has transpired, transpired Fired thus far on the journey that Jesus has taken with his disciples and all that was about to transpire was ordained, commanded of Jesus by the Father. Jesus obeyed the Father and abided in the Father's love. He was prepared to again obey the Father even to the point of death. As Jesus later said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. 
The Father loves the Son because the Son glorified the Father with his obedience. Abide in me, Jesus tells his disciples. I have loved you as the Father has loved me. Continue in my love if you keep my commandments. If you continue in my love, you will abide in my love. Jesus next tells his disciples that he has told them these things so that his joy will be in them and their joy will be complete. The Augsburg Commentary on the book of John explains that in telling them these things, Jesus is laying the groundwork, so to speak, for the astounding revelation that follows and is using the expression from the first farewell discourse in John 14. Nearing the time of his life, the end of the time of his life on this earth, Jesus alluded to his impending departure. And while giving the disciples a preview of his going away, he was also assuring them that the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in his name, will teach them everything they need to know. Jesus then commands them to love each other as he has loved them. And it's an amazing new depth to their relationship he now reveals. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Up until this point, Jesus and his disciples had a tacit master-servant relationship. There are 55 instances of the word master in the New Testament, yet I can find no instance of Jesus explicitly referring to himself as a master outside of these three instances in John. There are only five instances where the disciples refer to him, calling out to him as master. It isn't until the Last Supper that Jesus alludes to their master-servant relationship. After washing their feet, Jesus said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, slaves are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. This is my commandment, he tells them again, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. His friends, as written in the original Greek, it literally means the ones he loves, referring to those whom Jesus loves so dearly he will sacrifice himself. <coughs> he was asking them to lay down their lives for each other. At the same time, he was also speaking of himself, of what he himself was going to do for them on the cross, laying down his life. The love that Jesus showed his disciples, us, and the world is the only human example we have of perfect, complete, unconditional, and totally unselfish love. This is a radical transformation of the well-understood master-servant relationship, and it's light years away from what we have as an everyday understanding of friends. Robert Kaiser in the Augsburg Commentary on John explains it this way. Friendship implies a relationship of reciprocality and intimacy as opposed to the singular quality of obedience demanded of a slave. While servanthood is typical of Christians, the relationship described as abiding is one that makes the Christian more of a friend than a servant. The difference between friend and servant is knowledge. Jesus, explain, Jesus explains to his disciples why he no longer calls them servants. The servant is not privy to the plans and intents of the master. But Jesus has made known to them all that he has heard, all that he has heard from his Father, God. To cement this new and radical relationship with them in their minds, Jesus reminds them that they did not choose him. They did not stumble upon him at the seashore and say, we need a leader and we choose you. Jesus chose them. 
chose them with a purpose in mind. He chose them for a mission, one that would transform the world by their witness through their relationship with him, mirroring his relationship to the Father. I appointed you, he says, to go and bear fruit, fruit that will endure, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. The disciples, we as Christians, have been gifted the revelation of God in Christ and know the plan and intent of the Father. This is a gift of love. We share in a mission bestowed by Jesus upon the disciples. Go. Go in capital letters, bold type. That is the mission. Our life of faith is to be outwardly directed. It is to be directed toward the world, even as God's love is so directed. It is not an inward-oriented life, but one designed to glorify the Father for the benefit of the world. In the verse before this morning's gospel, Jesus said to his disciples, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The life of the believer glorifies God. God glorifies Jesus, the Son. And now the believers glorify the Father by going out, by spreading the good news. By loving each other, we believers bear good and enduring fruits. To be Christian means we are called to love all people, including imperfect people like ourselves. We are called to love, love them under all conditions, with all that we have, and with all of our abilities. Like the wheel in the homily by Dorotheus of Gaza, as we get closer to our neighbors, we get closer to God. Now with this unconditional love that we have received, this amazing grace, let us go and bear fruit that will last. Let us love another as our Lord Jesus commanded. Let us love our neighbor as ourselves, and let us love the Lord God with all our hearts and minds and souls, thereby obeying the greatest commandment given to the people of Israel in the desert. Thus, we will be glorifying God. Amen.